So it's a beautiful summer day. This is from a story on alternet.org, by the way. You pull on your stain-resistant cargo shorts and odor-resistant hiking socks, gulp down an energy-boosting supplement, slather yourself with sunscreen, and head out for a ramble in the woods. Are you poisoning yourself? When you get home, you jump in the shower and toss your clothes in the wash. Are you poisoning the environment? A nanometer is a distance, a measurement that is one billionth of a meter. A human hair is a hundred thousand nanometers wide. There are now products in our environment, like for example zinc oxide and sunscreen, that are made with nanoparticles, particles that are only one or two or three or forty or a hundred, below a hundred nanometers wide. That is, they're ten thousand uh, anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 times, uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And there's increasing evidence that much as we believed that asbestos would save us all, because it was going to be the great new fireproof solve all problems thing, and it was put in, you know, back in the at the turn of the century was put in homes and ships and well right up through World War II because the asbestos industry was using corporate personhood to to hide what they knew they said they had the right under the fourth and fifth amendment to privacy and not to tell people what they knew that uh, you know we discovered that uh, asbestos was pretty nasty stuff well now it turns out some British researchers doing some research on this because in Britain they do not allow these products to be sold until they are proved that they are safe, they use the precautionary principle, that carbon, uh, straight carbon nanotubes, nanoparticles, actually behave in the body of mice like asbestos. And in fact, they even get into the very same areas. This is a quote from this article. When mice inhaled CNTs, the tiny tubes migrated from their lungs to the surrounding tissue, the very spot where asbestos causes the rare cancer known as mesothelioma, which is uh, what killed my father, so I have a, uh, a dog in this fight, I guess. Should we how, do we, how do we decide what to keep and what to reject when it comes to things like these kinds of new technology, na nanotechnology? Dr. Yaron Brook is with me. He's the president of the Ayn Rand Institute, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D. Ayn Rand, of course, the author of Atlas Shrugged and the founder of the concept of objectivism, the notion of, well, I'll, I'll let Yaron say the notion, but I'll say that it, it has uh, over the years been in part, in spite, has in part inspired the libertarian movement and, and the modern conservative movement. Yaron, welcome to the show, and uh, you want to give us uh, objectivism in a sentence or three? Sure, but let me start with a disclaimer. I, I don't agree that it's inspired certainly the modern conservative movement. I think uh, conservatives are anything but objectivists. Yeah, but uh, the libertarians are on your side. Uh, on some issues, yes, yeah. uh, they're, they're a little bit more too much uh, subjectivists and uh, too f too <laughs> too strange. Um, but uh, objectivism is about uh, reason. It's about a, a morality of of uh, self interest, of of pursuing one's own happiness and one's own own well being as one's highest moral purpose in a rational, long term way. And uh, as a consequence, about a political system that leaves individuals to make the decisions for themselves, uh, you know, and to uh, get, gain the rewards when they make right decisions and, and suffer the consequences when they make wrong decisions. How do you then derive from yeah. that philosophy yeah. the suggestion that government should not play a role in making sure that before a product is introduced to the public, it's safe? Well, because I think that government's only role is to protect us uh, from violence from others and from fraud from others. So. I Why? Think, what? What is that? Why? Why well, wouldn't you, even even get in the context yeah. of the philosophy of objectivism that you just articulated? Why wouldn't government's role be to make sure that people are not killed by the by the by perhaps the well intentioned, but by the efforts of others? Well, because that is that is the responsibility of individuals who have, uh, I think, the capacity to make those evaluations for themselves. But I can't even okay. see a nanoparticle, well, much less evaluate its, its safety. Well, but 
they are, if, if it is a concern that you on the radio can voice that concern, there are agencies out there, private agencies, that can voice concerns and publish articles. There are doctors and physicians who can put out studies and, and, and show that, that these are harmful, and then individuals, based on that information, can make choices. Look, if we had a precautionary principle, we wouldn't have sugar today. Uh, we wouldn't be able to use sugar today because it causes diabetes, after all. We wouldn't be able to fly airplanes today because some of the airplanes crash, after all. The, the precautionary well, principle is a way... the boundary. The, we might not no, have, we might not I, have I, NutraSweet. Not. Think, about, think about the Wright brothers and the original airplanes and, and, and the kind of risks that are entailed when airplanes first took off, and the precautionary principle would prohibit most of that kind of innovation. You're on, uh, I'm sorry, Europe, with the precautionary principle, was the, was the continent that fielded, I mean, the two nations in Europe, the Brits and the French, were the, were the folks who fielded the first Mach 1, you know, plus Mach 1 plane, the, the, the first uh, uh, supersonic plane. Sure, because they ignored, the they ignored their own principle, and of course they're the ones who, who pulled the you know who pulled the first Mark Mark One plane off, and and it really you know never took off. But well, that's because the market for it collapsed after that spectacular blow up in in Paris. Yeah, well, may, maybe, but uh, or, or the or the regulators got afraid, which is exactly what the precautionary principle causes them to do. The the polit it plays into politics rather than science. Uh, it plays into public opinion rather than the, rather than real science, and that's what happens when you politicize these things. Let the marketplace, let the marketplace determine these things. When people discover that a certain product is dangerous because people like you advertise that it's dangerous, they will stop consuming it because they are rational and they're motivated by their own self-interest. They don't want to they don't want to do harmful things to themselves, and individuals can make those kind of decisions. And the point philosophically is that you know. People, in order to be allowed to live, to, to make the most out of their own lives, need the freedoms to make decisions for themselves. And they, they don't want and shouldn't want to have a paternalistic state dictate what they can and cannot do. Oh, well, again, I my, risk tolerance, my risk tolerance, for example, might be much higher than your risk tolerance. But a government agency, Are you familiar take, with... Take Vioxx, for example. No, no. Vioxx, Vioxx was just pulled off the market, right? But for some people... Vioxx is the only way they can live because the pain is so excruciating, and they're willing to take but the risk of heart disease. Vioxx, you know, is is, is uh, very Vioxx low grade. It's it's this, you know, the strength of aspirin. But but you're on. But, are but, you but familiar with the work of economist of, Richard Easterlin? So, uh, Richard Easterlin, I don't know. No. He's he's the guy who's he's done a whole bunch of studies. He he teaches at the University of California, mm -hmm. and uh, about the happiness economics. Okay, and he he did this very large, you know, about a twenty year study in the nineteen nineties and the early two thousands of the Iron Curtain countries as they went through shock therapy from communism to capitalism and so forth, and uh, this from the uh, from Live Science, the uh, Live Science magazine, uh, by Robin Lloyd, a new analysis of the happiness, or more specifically, the life satisfaction of people living in parts of Europe in the 1990s as the Iron Curtain fell, sheds more light on how our personal feelings of well-being respond to socialism, capitalism, and big economic transitions. The work, in short, suggests that our personal economic stability is more important to life satisfaction, a measure of, a measure of happiness or well-being, than GDP or socioeconomic or political order. In other words, free market capitalism only works when it works. When it doesn't, people prefer some form of socialism with guarantees of employment, education, and health care. If that's true, then you win and I lose, right? I, I don't believe that's true. I, I don't believe people are like that. But that's, I, it, but that's what all, all of the advanced countries of the world have chosen. No, that's absolutely right. And, and that's, I think, uh, going to be, we're going to pay for that. Uh, we're going to pay for that at a very, very heavy cost as we move into the future for that. Well, they seem to be paying for it with a higher quality of life and more life satisfaction. Oh, you know, we can, we can argue again about whether people in Europe are happy or not. Uh, you know, I, I, I would challenge that that argument, and indeed Europe is, is, is moving you think to the right just as we're moving to the left. But the, 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 I think the point is that I, you know, I, I challenge how they measure happiness. I've seen similar studies. You know, we could get into debate on how you measure happiness. What do you mean? But also, the fact is that yes, transitions are painful. Nobody likes transitions. When people grow up under communism, they get used to a certain system, and you shake them up suddenly. Well, we're talking about a transition like losing your job and thus losing your health care insurance, and losing then getting your job sick. And losing health care insurance today in America is caused by a move to the left, not by a move to the right. This crisis, to remind you again, was caused by government policies, not by the market. It was caused by the Federal no, Reserve. It was caused it was by. Caused by the 
Federal Reserve, Reserve, which you've agreed with me in the past, the Federal Reserve caused it, and the Federal Reserve is a public... A, 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 a I have agreed with you that the Federal Reserve is, is, is a malignant force. Sure, but, absolutely. But what caused really caused crisis. this was There's blowing up Glass-Steagall in 99. No, that's nonsense. It, they, I mean, it's the, the Federal Reserve caused this crisis, and Freddie and Fannie and, and all the housing policy caused this crisis. There's no absolutely reason in a free market for housing prices to go up the way they did. That can only happen when government manipulates. Well, or manipulation. Uh, if, if, well. Oh, the only entity that can. Uh, uh, I got it. And, 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 manipulation on that scale is government. No. No, I think I think Goldman Sachs can, can, but but we'll have to leave it at that, Iran. Yeah. I, you know, it's your dot org for all of Iran's writings. Thanks so much, Iran. Thank you.